Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights, created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Orstano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. The assumption is that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, what are you doing? Go out there and watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. Also, if you want to support the show, please go subscribe for free to our new YouTube channel. And you may have noticed we've shifted from our every Tuesday schedule and we are now releasing new episodes of the podcast every other week. That is correct, Stacey. We recap all your favorite episodes, chat with amazing guests, and answer your questions. So please email us anything you want to know at clearizefullheartspod at gmail.com. We've made it Season three, episode 13, Tomorrow Blues. It was written by Jason Kadams and directed by Jeffrey Reiner. Our NBC synopsis reads, five months after the state championship, big changes are afoot in Dylan, including Coach Taylor's suddenly uncertain future. Executive producer and director Jeffrey Reiner will join us later in the episode. But before we chat with Jeff, we're going to discuss this episode's highlights. Okay, I got to tell you right off the bat, Stacey, what? I love this opening shot of a baseball flying through the air. I don't think we've ever dealt with Dylan, Texas in spring. It's a wonderful little montage of flowers and Buddy and Coach playing golf and Tim and Billy are buying their tuxes and Tim and Nyla are laying out by the pool. Landry's swimming in the lake and Jacob Dylan's something good this way comes is playing in the background. It's all <laughs> bliss in little Dylan, Texas. So you know that the wheels are about to come off. Yeah, it doesn't stay good for long. No. I mean, this show does a montage better than just about anybody does a montage. I can't think of a better montage show. Anywho. We might be a little biased. Who knows? Okay. Mm -hmm. Aikman and McCoy taking over the Panthers. What? I did not know this happened because I have not watched the show and I did not read the parts of the script that I was not in. Yeah. Well, you know what, Stacey? What? It's a devil town. Oh. It's a devil town. Oh. There's snakes in the grass. It's so damn shady. And I told you that the wheels were going to fall off. They're starting it to get shaky. The wheels are shaking. Yeah. Question, everyone's talking about going to college. Is Landry a junior? Yes. But I think that this episode is the first time that we've ever officially established that. Interesting. But yes, I, I know he's a junior, but I can't remember if we've ever talked about him being a junior before. Yeah, I can't imagine Tammy going through everyone in the colleges they're going to and not Landry because he'd be the valedictorian. So now yeah. we know. I would like to say that I was right. Joe McCoy is pure evil. It's a devil town. And he's the devil. Yeah. And this is really the ugly, awful side of sports. McCoy has money. He's using his son as a bargaining tool. And he's put coach in the whole town, unbeknownst to the town, in a really terrible position. When I say unbeknownst to the town, what I mean by that is that they don't know what's good for him. And the reality is Coach Taylor is what's good for the town of Dillon, Texas, and specifically for Dillon Panther football. It irks me. I hate it. I don't like it. I want to punch Joe McCoy. Right in his stupid face. I want to punch Joe McCoy. He's like the worst stage mom that ever lived. <laughs> hate it him. He really is. I do love, however, you wearing a landing strip to the auction site. This might be the first landing strip t-shirt we've seen. I like to represent the landing strip. You got to represent your Beyonce's place of work. Yes, of course. I love this scene here. This guy that they hired is actually a real auctioneer. And Jeffrey Reiner just kind of let us play in this moment. Taylor and I knew that we had to bid and win the lift, the hydraulic lift. And we also knew that we had to win the steer. But pretty much everything else after that was just Kitch and I being idiots and playing around. Reiner just kind of let us have free reign, which was always fun. A little bit scary. Always fun. Yeah, a little bit. Meanwhile, then we cut right to this scene with Saracen dropping grandma off at the nursing home. Ugh. Every time I watch that scene, it literally destroys me. And I love the way that Jeffrey Reiner chose to shoot it with him in the foreground, grandma in the background. It's just a gorgeous little moment after he exits the room and mm -hmm. he's left to kind of dwell on this decision that he's made. Plus, we get that very sweet picture of what is actually a very young Zach Guilford and it makes yeah. me smile. <laughs> it's really cute. I just wrote down here, I love Landry so much. It's him and Tyra in the car. He pulls the car over and goes off yep. to the side of the road and just gives her the what for. Here's also what I love. It goes from those two standing outside of their car on the side of the road, smash cut 
to you and your brother standing outside of your truck on the side of the road. And it was just really great editing in that moment. Wouldn't it be interesting if they were literally on the other side of the road from us? You could just <laughs> yell at each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey! Landry, can you give us a ride? This is another one of those scenes that I really love. Lovely piece of direction by Jeffrey Reiner when we were shooting this. He once again just lets the two of us play in that scene. And he suggested that we start wrestling with each other in the end. It turns out that it's probably one of my favorite scenes on Friday Night Lights that I got to have. It's literally my favorite Riggins Brothers scene. Is it? Literally. I love it. Yeah. There's something in this one where you see not just the love and the playfulness, but there's like a joy that these two bring each other at the same time as they also can drive each other crazy. That's like brothers, brothers. Yeah. And I think that this is kind of leading up to the end of this episode and the start of the next season, which mm -hmm. is Tim, not so much wanting to leave Dylan. You're kind of getting this vibe. He's talking about, what am I going to do in this place? They don't have a bar like Smitty's. All these different things that are kind of popping up. And he can fix the truck and you couldn't. Exactly. And like, you're going to need somebody to work at Riggins Riggs. And Lila's not even going to go to San Antonio State mm -hmm. anymore. So that was the whole reason I was going to go there. He doesn't really want to play college football. And I get that too. I think there comes a point. He's not going to be going to the NFL. He's just going out there and playing football again. There is no higher goal anymore. And that team element is kind of gone when you go off to college. But anyway, it becomes more of a business, I guess is what I mean. He's mm. a little bit of a lost soul here. Yes. This scene where Tyra gets her letter from UT, I loved this day. I loved shooting this scene. I loved this moment for Tyra. I loved that they let me and Dana celebrate with them that we got to be excited too. And yes, Stacey Oristano herself sat on her couch and cried again watching <laughs> it. This is one of my favorite scenes on the show. It's just one of those amazing moments on Friday Night Lights. You've seen these characters go through so much. Any victory is like, yes, you, you're, mm -hmm. you're so attached to these characters at this point in time. But yeah, it's just an amazing moment when you guys come running out of the house, yeah. that letter goes flying off in the distance and Landry hops over the fence. And it's just all, like all of it. As I said before, all the elements come together. And it just, every time I watch that scene, I'm pfft, tears. Oh, but yeah. Mindy's such a brat too. And I was trying to hide it in a drawer. And I'm like, she can't read this till after the wedding because I was dead convinced she wasn't getting into college. Mindy's such a brat. <laughs> it's also pretty selfish on Mindy's end. Like, I don't want her to ruin my it wedding. it is. <laughs> She's going to ruin my wedding with uh. her pouty face. <laughs> I would just like to tell the audience that what I wrote down next in the notes is I would just like to take a second to say that Kyle Chandler is incredibly handsome. And it happened when he walks into the meeting where they're deciding about who the coach is going to be and he, he has a suit on and he like has his hair combed and I just had a minute where I went, God, he's handsome. Newsflash, ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Chandler is good looking. I don't know if you guys News knew flash, that. Newsflash, extra, extra, read all about it. <laughs> guys, a little behind the scenes here, Kyle Chandler's yeah. handsome. <laughs> yes, this is news to all of us. It only took Stacy what, 39 episodes No, to get I there. just try not to say it every episodes. episode. Jeez. I get you, I get you. Because the people would turn their radios off. Radios? <laughs> they're, they're iPhones? Oh God, who cares? What am I talking they're about? They're iPods? I don't know what they listen to. They're I transistors. Mean, yeah, iPad? Yeah. Okay, the version that I watched, sometimes Sometimes guys, different platforms have to cut down different shows for different times. And our vows got cut out of the version that I was watching. So I want to go in search of one where they kept them in because yours to me were golden. I think if you download the show on Amazon, Amazon. or if you download it on Apple TV, maybe. Or if you got those DVDs. Yeah, or if you got the DVDs, you will get the original NBC cut version of it, maybe. Yeah. Or no, it would be the, the original DirecTV, DirecTV cut version. Because DirecTV didn't have to worry about time constraints so much as NBC had to because there's advertisers, blah, blah, blah. Long story. But yeah, if you ever want to see an episode in its entirety, the director's cut, essentially, mm -hmm. I haven't noticed massive differences, but it seems to always be in stuff that we're in. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> yeah. it's inconsequential. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter. It was just really funny. Tell them what you did. Tell them what you did. Oh, I think I said, I love you. I always have. And then I looked over at Tim and I go, Braveheart. It was hysterical. Yeah. This episode, and specifically our wedding, and I know I talked about this in the last episode, is the most pages we ever shot in a day. The average show shoots about five pages a day, maybe four pages. And once again, I got a harp on this. We shot 18. You guys, it's a lot. Yeah, one third of the episode in one day. 
And we did it with about 150 background actors. Truly one of the more amazing feats I've ever seen pulled yeah. off by a crew on any show that I've ever worked on. Big shout out to Jeffrey Reiner on this one. Specifically on this episode, something that I thought was kind of interesting is that Ray Romano was mm -hmm. in town and he came to our set and he was like, I heard, I can't do a Ray Romano, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but he was like, I heard that you guys have like the fastest moving show in the business. And he said, I just wanted to come down and see how you guys shoot. And so he sat there with Jeffrey Reiner in Video Village and watched how we did everything, watched how we had three cameras rolling at all times. I remember having lunch with him that day mm -hmm. and all of us sitting there and his eyes were just wide because he'd done how many seasons of Everybody Loves Raymond? And he's like, yeah. I didn't know we could do it like this. You guys, Ray Romano was at our wedding. Yeah, he was. Ray Romano would very shortly thereafter go on to work on a show called Men of a Certain Age, and they basically adopted the same techniques that Friday Night Lights used to shoot their show. But look, it doesn't work on every show, having three cameras rolling, but I think on certain shows, it's like, why are you not doing it this way? Because it's hard. I also, because I remember the scene, I remember Kyle and Connie coming and sitting down, and I remember the lines that they had to each other, and I could sort of tell that it was important. I didn't realize how important it was because like I was busy getting married and whatever. And again, I didn't watch the show. It just the look that Tammy gives coach and he knows in that moment he's fired. That happened at our wedding. I didn't know what the time, what the stakes yeah. were. And so many different things were happening inside of our little wedding. Like I didn't know at the time. Enough time has gone by now that I can look back and I'm just so impressed with the writing, the acting, the shooting yeah. and everything that we did within this one day. The writing on this episode in particular, it's just top notch. And I know I'm biased. It's my wedding episode, but it's mm. not even about our wedding as much as it is all the other stuff that's going on. It yeah. is, if not my favorite episode of Friday Night Lights, definitely in my top, it's definitely in my top five. We talk about things getting cut because it's inconsequential. There's also a best man speech that Tim gives mm -hmm. where he tells everyone at the wedding that I'm pregnant and I yell at him and throw champagne on him. And that got cut. Yep. Absolutely, it got cut because it doesn't matter to anyone in the story that I'm pregnant. So of course yeah. it got cut. It should have got cut, but it was really fun because Tim and I yelled at each other and it was fun to shoot. Yeah. But like, it, it doesn't belong there. There's so many major moments that happen in this wedding. And we'll talk to Jeffrey Reiner about this a little bit later. But like in the script, it did say that there were like Tim pulls Billy aside or Billy does this or Lila and Tim have a private conversation. One of the brilliant mm -hmm. things that I think Jeffrey Reiner did, and we'll talk to him about this later when we've got him on is that he shot all these scenes with all of us in the room. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a private moment for anybody. It was actually an argument that Reiner and I had while we were shooting this. And I think I talk about it with him when he comes on. Brilliant, the way it's all pieced together. Pieced together. And then after we realize everything that's going on and everyone is having their couple turmoil, their inner turmoil, there's just a minute where everything rests. And mm -hmm. Tyra is leaving. Lila is leaving. Matt is leaving. Coach is fired, but here we all are just sitting on a dance floor, holding on to people that we love and dancing. And it just sits and rests and everyone is just being for a moment. And it's gorgeous writing. Yeah, it really is. Heaven. I don't even know what else to say. I am such a fan of this episode on so many different levels. The writing being first and foremost, but I mean, even the band that we have at the wedding. I love them know, singing. The location at the wedding. They get a really lovely moment where Amy Teagarden is being Amy Teagarden and probably didn't know that there was a camera on her and she's got a spoon resting on her nose. I it's loved that. It's all those little moments that just kind of pop up throughout this show, specifically this episode. I mean, from scene to scene, we didn't know what was being shot. We were or having conversations. Or if we were in we the were background. Yeah. We didn't know what was going on. We were moving so fast on this episode and specifically in these scenes. As I said, 18 pages, guys. 18 pages in one day. There's also a moment where Coach and Tammy are like, I don't know why we're here. I don't know Billy yeah. Riggins. And Tammy's like, I think they really look up to us. And I was like, ooh, foreshadowing. We really yeah. do. Yeah. It was really sweet. I love that Saracen breaks Grandma Saracen out and brings her to the wedding. First of all, yes, because oh. Grandma Saracen and I have a relationship. We went to state together and I love her. I'm yeah. sure she was invited, but maybe didn't think she should come because of whatever. She needed to be at the wedding for it to be a whole FNL love. That made me very happy. Yeah. So we didn't shoot this in order. One of the first things after the chapel that we shot was Derek and I running out of the church and getting rice 
thrown at us. So nobody told the background actors what to do. They just handed them bags of rice. So Derek and I hold hands. We run out of the church and everyone throws rice directly at us. One gets in my eye. They're stuck to every part of our body. It is actually painful. Taylor Kitsch is crying. He's laughing so hard. And so we cut, you and I went to Reiner and we were like, if we could maybe tell everyone to just toss the rice up and not directly in our faces, it would be really great. And then we continued to shoot the rest of the stuff inside. And it was another 10 hours. And that that dress was corseted and really, really tight. At the end of the day, when I went into my trailer and took that dress off, like a pound of rice fell out (laughs) of my dress. And I don't know if you've ever like knelt on rice, but I had imprints of tiny little rice bits in my back for probably like five days, like tiny little welty bruises of rice (laughs) that had just been stuck in me all day from people throwing rice directly at me. That's hysterical and gross at the same time. Do you remember that though, (laughs) when they just threw it directly at our face? I totally remember getting the rice in my face because Mm -hmm. I went over to Jeffrey Reiner and I was like, dude, I feel like some people were just throwing the bags at us. Oh, they were pelting us. Yeah, it was like, what are you idiots doing? Mm -hmm. I was not in a good mood. (laughs) No, I wasn't. We were picked. And also Kitsch was laughing so hard at us. But really, there was a piece of rice stuck in my eye. Okay, that's enough about rice. Yeah. This episode is so good on so many layers and so many levels. It is so specifically good for you and Taylor. Yeah. That scene that you do before we go into the limo is good gracious. Yeah, I love shooting that scene. Originally, that scene was supposed to be an interior shot. And Jeffrey and I had a little argument about it. He had the idea of, no, no one gets their private moment in this episode. And as I said, we'll talk about that with Jeff later. I now see what he was going for. And I go, oh, I get he's it. right. Oh, he's 100% right. Yeah. And it's a brilliant little moment. I love that they kept, I screwed up and I said, now I got to go to Puerto Rico. And I said, Puerto Rico, what what did I just say? And they kept Puerto Rico. Doesn't matter. Of course, Billy would say Puerto Rico. Why not? Mm -hmm. I love that moment. I love that moment with the two of them. I think it speaks volumes of the relationship that they have and how much Billy just truly wants for Tim to have better than he did. Yeah. There's a minute where I tell him he's an ass before we get in the limo. And it just looks like I'm being a jerk, but it is because he told everybody I was pregnant before. I just want to put that out there. Oh, I didn't even think about that. But it's also the fact that he's like stopping you from getting in your car. Like, yeah, but it's less about that. Like, like he could say goodbye to his brother, but really yes. I was still mad at him from a scene that got cut. So gotcha, 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 gotcha. That happens that sometimes. Happening. <laughs> I don't want to harp on it too much. I don't have the words to actually express what I want to say this ending shot of coach and Tammy walking onto the East Dillon field. It's dilapidated. It's broken. It's ugly. There's a flare coming from the sun that hits the camera so perfectly. And they just stand there and the camera pulls back. It's goosebumps when it happened. I have goosebumps and I'm thinking about it. It is literal. And I'm using that term in the right way, perfection. And all that stuff is scripted, guys. I mean, obviously, it's carried out beautifully by our camera operators and by Jeffrey Reiner, who directed it. I know that Friday Night Lights did not have a big budget in these later three seasons. And so getting a crane was always Mm -hmm. a big deal. So we got a crane shot. You know, oh, we got a crane. We got a crane. I know that they were chasing time. They had to get that light. They had to get that light. We're all sitting here as fans going, so what the hell happens next? So coach is no longer Mm -hmm. the coach of Dylan. Lila's gone. Matt's gone. And you see the faded lions painted on the side of the stands. Faded red lions. Tyra's leaving. Coach is fired. Tim is leaving. What the hell are we going to do? And I think this episode ends with all of us going, that can't be how it ends. Yeah. What happens next? Another wonderful thing that kind of happened because the writers knew that they had three seasons to work with. You could write an episode for a season finale that wasn't a potential finale for the series. It was, nope, this is how this season ends. Holy cow, everything is up for grabs. I mean, everything that we thought we knew, all the characters that we love, half of them are gone. Not to mention the fact that Smash is already gone. Street's already gone. Jason's gone. Yeah. So what the hell is this story going to be about next season? Everything changes. I kind of started watching a little bit. I got a little bit ahead. Oh, man. Season four, episode one. And I can't wait to start talking about all the changes that are coming our way. Well, before we do that, let's talk to Jeffrey Reiner. Of course, of course, of course. We got Jeffrey Reiner coming on. So please stick around.
We are beyond thrilled to have the ridiculously talented Golden Globe and Peabody Award winning executive producer and director of Friday Night Lights, Jeffrey Reiner, on the show with us today. Jeffrey Reiner has worked as a director and executive producer on a variety of different TV shows, including The Division, Surface, Conviction, Caprica, Trauma, The Event, Awake, Do No Harm, Homeland, 12 Monkeys, Fargo, The Affair, Shameless, and Dirty John. Also, High Fidelity and Away. Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. You're welcome. What do you got to say? Well, I said it in private, but the three actors who do this podcast are in my top Hall of Fame. I love them all. They were cast after the pilot, I believe, or maybe uh, Derek. Was I was cast the during the pilot, but yeah, right. and then and everybody Steve, else. Yeah, yeah, Steve yeah me and Steve were later. And they became almost series regulars in a way, maybe not paid that way, but <laughs> no. integral parts of the show. And they come from this, I don't know how this school turns out these actors, Baylor University, but they do. I say that from the bottom of my heart. I love working with the three of you. And Your I shows, so you, much, but... you took us on to other shows with you. So yeah. thank you. That's right. Thank you so much. But not as I much as I want to, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is a huge compliment coming from you. First and foremost, I want our audience to know that it's impossible to talk about Friday Night Lights without talking about Jeffrey Reiner. I can't impress upon y'all enough how vital Jeffrey was to every aspect of this show, from the look, to the feel, to the style, to the music, the wardrobe, the hairstyles, camera setups, naturalistic acting, the, the casting choices, the locations, literally everything we see on camera from the pilot on comes through your interpretation of what the writers set down on paper. Yet if I go on IMDb and I look up your job title, it just says director, executive producer. And this is a total misnomer. And it truly pisses me off because it says nothing at all about what you did on this show and how integral you were to what we as an audience love about Friday Night Lights. So I'm going to ask you, how would you describe your title or your job on Friday Night Lights? Well, I think that from the pilot, which was directed by Pete Berg, it is a very much of a in my opinion, a TV show where a director has a lot of influence. And it's because we essentially deconstruct what's on the page a little bit. People think it's all improvisation, but it's really just deconstructing it, which really makes it more realistic. And it takes a director to do that, to not rehearse, to not block, to let the actors improvise, and to find a different way of telling the scenes and the stories. Really, it's bringing a nonlinear approach to linear filmmaking, right? So in normal scenes, you'd have a A, B, C, D rhythm. Friday Night Lights was about finding it in a different way, going A, D, B, C. And it's that kind of way, that deconstruction that gave it its realistic and honest approach. Something like that had never been done in television. So it was creating a culture and making sure that everybody understood it. And it was really just being brave. So the first minute I showed up, they had a big soundstage where they were planning to build sets. And my first thing said, we'll never use this. Was that in Texas they were doing that? Yes, we had rented a huge soundstage. We shot not one scene there. I didn't I'm, know that. Yeah. yeah, I made up my mind that we would shoot everything in real locations. I made it in my mind that we would use non-actors as much as we could. Yeah. How did you get the powers that be to go along with that? The idea that you're not going to shoot anything on a soundstage, that you're going to shoot everything on location and knowing that you're going to have to move locations for, you're going to have two or three moves a day sometimes. Like well, how does anybody allow yeah. that to happen that has <laughs> money? Well, you just said the magic word money. We <laughs> did not cost a lot of money. Mm. We were so cheap that they just let us do whatever we wanted. I don't think you could do that now. Yeah. I think it's yeah. way too corporate. We were in Austin, Texas. They loved the pilot that Pete Berg had done. And we just started coming in really under budget. Mm -hmm. And that buys you so much freedom. Yeah. And they liked what they saw. I think it was season two where they were going to cancel us. I remember going into a meeting with Jason KMs and our other EPs. And I had pretty much come up with a plan to shoot our shows in less than seven days. I think it was six and a half days. Because you guys know, we would be done by lunch half the time. Yeah. I think that's what gave us the second season. I mean, I've been told, I think Jason even told me yeah. that. Listen, it's cynical, but it's like, I think the fact that we were spending such little money because our ratings weren't that great. 
Yeah. So we were able to do that. And it was just creating a culture. You know, it got to the point where we got to know Texas. We got to know the environment. I'd walk into a jewelry shop and I met the owner and they would send like an actress to play the owner. And then I would say, I don't want this actor. I want this owner to do it. Right. We talked about this when we had Jesse Plemons on the show. There was mm-hmm. literally this specific scene with the jewelry shop yeah, owner and the woman who was in it. Looking for she was spectacular. Little right. tiny Texas school marm kind of thing. But like, she's like, well, you're looking for jewelry. You ought to look at this one right here. And it was just so natural, so real. I remember she said, well, is it a serious girlfriend type of ring or a just a normal girlfriend ring? And it was like, oh my God, we are in there, you know? Yeah, she was so selling the jewelry. Yeah, We are. So it was creating a way of filmmaking that threw caution to the wind. That was my biggest job. And a lot of it was done through directing. Because if I can remember the first season, we, we did 21 episodes. I believe I directed 11 or 12 of them. That's insane. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I made a lot of people, I think, some crew people crazy the first season. <laughs> I think we went through five sound people before we got the one who could stick it out. (laughs) I remember one of our script supervisors literally had a panic attack or (laughs) she had a psychic breakdown. I have to explain for our audience what it is exactly that a script supervisor does, but like a script supervisor, just make sure that there's continuity in a scene. So if I was holding something in my left hand on the first take, I need to be holding it in my left hand on the second take. But on Friday Night Lights, all that stuff was kind of out the window. And I remember there was a scene that Taylor Kitsch and I were shooting. We shot three takes of it where Kitsch was standing like on the left and I was standing on the right. And then the last scene, we just switched it. And I was standing on the right and Kitsch was now standing on the left. And our script supervisor was literally shaking and she was like, you, you can't do that. I you agree with her that. on that. And I'm like, That's you can't do crazy. what? And she's like, you can't so, just switch sides completely and totally. Well, because yes. we, knew we, we knew we'd use like one another, but I remember a scene that you and Taylor Kitsch did. We moved so quick that you guys showed up in a garage that you were going to buy and the sound mixer wasn't there yet. So we just started shooting without sound because we were doing big wide shots. So yeah, it I, it's me like, pushing him around in like a chair, or like yeah. sweeping the garage out or something. Right. I can't remember, but yes. Yeah. I think that my chief job was anarchist in <laughs> the house. Anarchist was <laughs> making things completely crazy and nonlinear and anything could happen, you know, yes. and bringing the outside world into it and just kind of, being brave, because it's one thing to do it on the pilot. It's, it's another thing to do it on an everyday television show. Yeah. And my job was to also understand the scripts, understand where the emotionality was, where the parts that we had to get across, mm-hmm. right? What is this scene about? What is this episode about? And really making sure that everybody knew that. Because I think the one thing that people don't speak to regarding the writing, the, the, there's this fallacy that we just improvise. Well, yeah. We didn't just, yes. we, we improvised on top of scripts, but what was always inherent in the script was the emotional kind of truth. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we just found in sometimes in a different way. You know? There's a moment I wanted to talk about specifically, and it was the first season of the show, I think episode eight, the episode I believe was called Crossing the Line, but there's a scene where Taylor and I get into an argument. Mm-hmm. And we have this big fight. On paper, it says Billy stands up at one point and throws a beer bottle up against the wall. And I remember we shot it one time. I was happy with it. I, I was like, yeah, crushed it. Felt good. The scene ends with a fight. There's a, an actual physical fight. You said, don't get physical. We're going to stop it, right? You know, get up in each other's faces and then we'll yell cut. And so what happened is we shot it the first time. I stand up. I throw the bottle up against the wall. I'm thinking, this is great. I nailed it. And you went over to props and you go, how many of those bottles do we have? And they said, I think we have 12. You said, bring all the bottles out right now. You brought all the bottles out. You put them on the counter. You said, give them a golf club. And now I've got a golf club in the scene. And I stand up and instead of throwing the bottle up against the wall, I've got the golf club in my hands. And as an audience, we're now sitting here going, holy crap, is he going to hit him in the face with a golf club? Like, what the hell is he doing? So now there's this level of tension throughout the whole entire scene that wasn't there before. Before, it's just a guy getting angry. And now... At one point, I swing the golf club and I hit all 12 of those breakaway bottles. We break all 12 of those breakaway bottles. And then right before we get to the physical part, you yell cut. You whisper something in Taylor's ear. You come back over to me and we shoot the scene. And instead of yelling cut, Taylor now tackles me on the floor. And we just shot the whole entire physical scene. Both of us had had agreed beforehand that we, we were all padded up and everything. 
it was like, we don't need a stunt coordinator to, to choreograph the scene. It's two brothers. They're not like pro MMA guys. My point was though, how open you were to allowing us to just play in those moments. And I've always said this, when I talk about you, I always talk about the fact that what Jeffrey Reiner did so well, at least in my opinion, as an actor, is he took what was a good scene on paper and he took it to another level and made it great. The tension was just magnified by a thousand. And that scene became one of these scenes that became a very iconic moment on Friday Night Lights. And it's really and truly all because of you. I mean, it's all organic. None of it is staged. It feels very real because we shot it. I mean, in two takes, three mm -hmm. takes. Yeah, thanks. I do remember there was a bag of Cheetos. Kitch had a bag of Cheetos in his hands and he was throwing them at me. And then when I tackled him, the Cheetos went everywhere. And so we're literally <laughs> like wrestling around in a bag of Cheetos. I asked Pops to go to the store and get like 10 bags of Cheetos. Yes. Yes. That's, like, that's the vision you had in your mind for this fight. <laughs> but I also love the idea that it's a bag of Cheetos and it's not a brick. You know what I mean? It's right. like there's something. Well, I, I very... thought of the Cheetos at the moment. He went to that convenience store around the corner. It was finding the real world. I mean, in the third season, we shot at a mega church. And the reason I had gone scouting at somebody's house and they were members of this mega church. And I called Jason. I said, we should do something about a mega church. Mm -hmm. And I met the pastor and we shot in that church. He acted in it. Remember, we had a big service at the mega church because we just was exploring the environments of where we were. I mean, you guys getting married, that was like, oh, this is Stacy. She's a stripper. And then we did that whole scene, that completely improvised day at the Mexican restaurant yes. where you ask her. Proposal. Yeah. yeah. And actually, they played a song that I wrote. Yes, we uh, talked yeah, about that. We John talked Parker. about it. <laughs> Yeah, John, John Parker. Parker. I actually wrote John that Parker, song. John Parker, John Parker. What are the lyrics? <laughs> John Parker, John Parker. Strolling yeah. down the line. John Parker, uh, John Parker. <laughs> I remember. John Parker was one of our crew members. Yeah, he was uh, Yeah, he was our crew member. God, you know, even when we went in the wheelchair into the rehab place, Phil, the nurse, was a nurse. We oh, talked about we that talked as about well. talked about that too. Yeah. And yeah. He, He's I just, so good. I just He's gave great. him the job. And I would just call Jason and say, Jason, we got to use this guy, you know. I think I took the lead from the pilot. I just made it just crazy kind of anything goes. And the fact that we could do it on the cheap, mm -hmm. that's what kept us on the air. You know? That's something I wanted to talk to you about as well. I mean, there was a day when we were shooting up Billy's wedding. I'm sorry, your wedding? <laughs> sorry, yes. Mindy's <laughs> wedding. Billy was an attendee. We shot 18 pages that day. I remember Monday. it specifically because Raymond yeah. Ray Romano was on set that day. And he was there specifically because he's like, I heard that you guys shoot the show. I'm not going to do a Ray Romano. That's terrible, uh, Ray Romano. Terrible. But he, he says, I, I, I heard that you guys shoot this show and sometimes you shoot upwards of like eight pages a day. And Reiner's like, yeah, we're going to shoot <laughs> 18 <wait>. today. <laughs> guys, I just want you to know it's unheard of. I mean, I've worked on shows where you shoot six maybe and that's a crazy long day. But to shoot 18 pages in a day, it just, it's impossible. It's not done. And we did it. We did it twice that season, if I'm not mistaken, because we also did it at the football state. Yeah, well, it's just the way we shot. We did not rehearse. We did not block. We did not cut, you know, no. really. Yeah. And we shot film. So they would just reload the cameras. I was a whirling dervish. You know, I was a little <laughs> crazy. I remember numerous times you holding like a broomstick and being like, why is it taking so long? Come on, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Well, you would well, always I, find something to have in your hand to bang. You calling yourself the head anarchist, though, is a great way to describe and it. And whirling because, dervish. Yeah, and whirling dervish. I mean, because yeah. it was. But it also, it felt so organic and real. And I remember one of the only times you and I, or I ever had an argument with you, I got mad <laughs> at the wedding. <laughs> And I remember this specifically because we were about to shoot a scene and they started setting the cameras up outside. And on paper, the scene was an interior shot. And I go, hey, are we moving on to my scene? And you go, yeah. Have you read the script? And I go, yes, I read the script. And it says in the script that it's an interior shot. And you're like, well, everybody wants their private moment today. You're not getting a private moment. And I'm like, I don't want a private moment. I just want to know what we're shooting. That was a crazy day. Every actor was coming up to me. Yeah. Because they thought it was going to be the series finale. <laughs> Every actor was mad at me for not giving them their close-up. I didn't want a close-up in that dress. I'm out of that. When Everybody. that episode aired, I had to call you on the phone and be like, 
I now understand what you're going for. So I was looking at it you from my perspective right. of what Billy was doing in this scene of and course. not in the overall, because in that script on paper, it was like, hey, can I talk to you real quick? And everybody was moving off and have, and you were like, no, we can't, we'll never get through this episode if we do it that way. It's a wedding. People have conversations in public, in public <laughs> places at a wedding. So if this private conversation is happening at the table with five other people around, so be it. Yeah. And it made the flow of that episode organic and real. It wasn't people having to grab each other and go, hey, let me talk to you real quick in this corner. <laughs> That's another TV show. I remember that half the wedding party were crew members. Yeah, yeah, our preacher and everybody. Also, it's interesting we talk about like the way that we shot and there were people, sometimes people would come in, be it a guest star or even a guest director and like it just didn't work. They didn't want to play in that space that you essentially, you and Pete Berg had created. So like either you were in or you're like, it wasn't your jam. Yeah, so I had interesting. a few directors and actors who just didn't get it. You know? It just didn't fit. And it's like, you guys are doing this? I said, like, yeah, this is the way we do it. So, uh, one director called it a cult. <laughs> You know, for years, I was asked to do shows in that style. And I kind of did a few. And it's funny because I did it for that. And it wasn't really my style before. And it's not my style now. I might do a project in that style, but it just worked for that. It just yeah. worked. And it's become kind of a trope now. Mm -hmm. There's all these three camera shows. It's not the cameras. It's no. It's the freedom to give actors the ability to move like they want to. That show was so good for me to give up a lot of the things that I had learned and learn yeah. how to be free. It's very scary, you know, for people to let go of their shot list or the rehearsed lines. But for me, I mean, I worked with Connie. There was a lot of improvisation going around where an actor maybe did not want to do the scene as written. It's like, oh, OK, let's just improvise it. And I love chaos. I do. I love when things yeah. are falling apart. That's when you come up with some really great ideas. So yeah. it was pretty much like that 24-7. That was our yeah. cult. Can There's we go a lot of freedom for a in that. minute? How did you actually come to FNL? Good question. I had done work for NBC. I directed and produced some of their shows. The real thing is that the head of NBC at the time knew me for my first movie. And it was a movie called Blood on Concrete. She just liked me and she liked that movie. And now that I was like an established TV director and producer, she introduced me to them. I got to tell you guys, I was offered another gig at the same time for twice the money. And I won't mention what it was. And it would have been like just unbelievable amount of money. And I turned it down to work on Friday Night Lights. It was the best move I ever made in my career. That's, Michael Waxman has a similar story like that. And I can't fathom what our world would have been without you and Michael Waxman. God, I love that guy because I love him so much. he yeah. had come from working with Michael Mann and I was not the easiest guy to like AD for. And Michael was the greatest AD I've ever worked with. Yeah. I gave him his first directing gig and then I made him a producer and then he took over. David Boyd was another character who we gave a directing gig and David and I worked. And people always say that David Boyd and I, there's no two people like us, you know, because we're just so free sometimes in the way we work. Yeah. So it was a really great crew. The spirit was there. It was very rock and roll, you know, it was like, it's the most rock and roll crew I've ever worked with. Everybody was cool. And if you weren't cool, you quit. Yeah. Because you just couldn't handle it. Yeah. yeah. There was something about that too. This idea, when we talk about the fact that we didn't have rehearsals, it's not because we were rock stars or because we thought we were cool. There is something organic that you find by not setting something in stone and that freedom to improv, that freedom as an actor to be able to move, to not be beholden to something that I did in the wide nine hours ago. There's a freedom in that. And with that freedom, you find something that's more naturalistic, more organic as an actor. I wasn't ever beholden to, I got to hit this mark. I did this six hours ago in the wide shot. So now I have to do this again in the close up. Well, it wasn't six hours later because it was six no. minutes later. It was six, six minutes, minutes later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like, I never let anybody reset props or reset mm -hmm. background. I wanted mistakes to happen continuously. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted, again, there to be chaos. And for every line of dialogue that an actor did, it was a response. And it yeah. wasn't a planned response.
Let me ask you guys a question. I heard from actors that the transition from going from that show into the workforce was very hard. Hard, especially because for that was my first ever on camera gig. So I was like, oh, it must always kind of be this like loose and free. So then I went to CSI straight after, which couldn't be more the opposite as far as like hitting a mark and regimented and not moving and word perfect. And I had like leaned up against a wall for a minute and it left a mark on my arm and they were like, well, we have to stop and wait for Stacy's arm to be normal again. And I was like, we don't do this on Friday Night Lights. I'm sorry, guys. It's like a really fast lesson for me into like what my job pool is going to be now. It was a learning curve coming off Friday Night Lights and then all of a sudden having to hit marks and all that different stuff. But then there were times, I mean, there was a project I worked on where we showed up to set and we had the director literally telling us, okay, you're going to stand here on this line you're getting up on and you're doing this. And so you're being puppeteered as an actor. I had this idea of what the scene would be in my head and then you get to set and you're literally just doing what the director has told you to do. Part of being an actor is being malleable. And I mean, sometimes there's some freedom and restriction, but I think that what made Friday Night Lights work on so many different levels is what you were talking about earlier. And it's that freedom that every department had that they felt like they were actually bringing something to it. And when I show up together. to set as an actor and I say, hey, I want to stand here and I want to move here and I want to, and you would just observe. You were the observer who went, okay, I see where your instincts are. Here's what I think we can do to make it better. That's what you did with every department, basically. Okay, I see where your instincts are as a costumer or as a wardrobe person or as a makeup person. And you let those people play, but you oversaw it and reined it in and made sure that it was the way you wanted it to be. And then multiple times, it's why I tell the story about the bottles, to accelerate the scene to another level that I hadn't seen, that I hadn't picked up on paper. It was a fire and you made it an inferno. Everybody understood it on the show. Mm -hmm. So, you know, God, I put so many crew members in as actors. And so it was like this weird rolling thing where that location guy has acted in the show. He's never acted before. Yeah. So suddenly, like, he understands it from a radically different point of view now. There was a director who just never really got it. I had met Rick Barnes, coach of Texas, the guy who recruited Kevin Durant to come play there mm -hmm. on an airplane. We were sitting next and we started talking and we had a scene, a recruitment scene where I needed a, a coach was recruiting Smash. So I said, hey, Rick, you want to act in the show? He goes, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, for him, it's perfect. So I remember telling the director they did first take and they did a, a script that I said, listen, man, this guy is one of the top three basketball recruiters in the country. Just let him do his thing. Yeah. And he couldn't wrap his head around it. Mm -hmm. He couldn't wrap his head. And I always thought that was a kind of lost opportunity. Yeah. Because like, who better than, than this guy to come and recruit our players? We've obviously had a bunch of different actors on the show, numerous actors that you actually cast on Friday Night Lights. Mm -hmm. How did you get those naturalistic performances from some of these people that had never acted in their lives? The idea was that they would never fill the camera on them. It's funny. I went and did a pilot a year later, or two years later, and I shot it in the same style. I remember we were shooting for like 30 minutes and the actor came up to me and said, are you going to start shooting? <gasps> I said, dude, it's done. We got the whole scene because we didn't block and we didn't rehearse. I don't think half of them even thought that we were shooting. Yeah, because they always want to know, well, are we quarter? Are we in my close up? Like, don't worry about it. We got it. So yeah. would you just go to like a, the, job. the salesperson of the jewelry store, for instance, and say, hey, sell them a, a ring. Yeah. I would, and then just start rolling. Yeah. I'm or tell football coach go in and yell at this player or, I mean, this is crazy. I think I upgraded, which is taking an extra and giving them a speaking line, which you cannot do anymore, pretty much. SAG has all these rules. Really? I think I might have put almost 20 people upgrades in one episode, yeah. which is freaking crazy. Yeah, it's okay. unheard of. Today, you'd get a call from the studio saying you can't do it. No, you mm. just tapped Hartley to half of Texas into SAG. <laughs> also, there's something about the way that you talk about just filmmaking in the process and from working with you on set, you have an innate love, a love of actors and a love of the process and a love of the crew. And it comes through in these, you guys, Jeffrey takes the most amazing still photography, usually like black and white photos. And you can just tell from your eye and from what you capture, how much you actually love the entire art of it. They're gorgeous. Thank you. Well, the business is trying to beat that out of me. Uh, you know. <laughs> this, this was 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 
listen, I love filmmaking. I love mm-hmm. visual arts. I love actors. I love it all. I, I can't say that I love the business that much, but we never felt like we had the business on Friday night. Like they wow. let us do what we wanted to do. Even though it didn't make a lot of money, you know, you guys know from residual checks, it's a show that keeps on giving, man. Yeah, yeah man, those 17 cent checks are hit. <laughs> it's been viewed by more people. And yeah. I'm an elder statesman in the business and all these young actors, oh, it's my favorite show on TV. It's because they didn't mess with us. They let us do what we wanted to do and they gave us a freedom. So it made me love it even more. That show... It incorporated, I mean, that's what filmmaking does. And I just let the people do what they do. And I appreciate that you like my self photographs. You can go to Jeffrey Reiner for photography and you'll see a, a lot of photography on that. I didn't know that. Do you know how yeah. excited that makes me? I don't have, I don't know if I have all the Friday Night Lights. No, yet. I want to see all of your stuff. You're just your eyes. So I'm assuming cool. it's jeffreyreinerphotography.com. Yes. Oh okay, my cool. God, yeah, I love I'll this. Definitely check it out right after this. And I love actors. Oh, and you do. You can tell. Yeah. Sometimes directors like don't want to deal with us. I wanted to ask you real quickly, and I was kind of touching on it earlier, but we've had obviously numerous actors on this show come on and talk with us at this point in time. And all of them have talked about the audition process and specifically the audition process they had with you getting mm-hmm. on the show. And I mean, the audition process for Friday Night Lights was unlike anything else that most actors have ever had to experience yeah. nine times out of 10, the scripts just being tossed aside and like, just improv, just play with me and getting up in actors' faces or actors getting up in your face. And nine times out of 10, it seems like the actor that got physical or close to physical with you wound up getting the job. So what was it you were looking for in the audition room when you were auditioning actors for Friday? I wanted them to kind of, it's a good question because now that you remember, like I'd say, okay, let's do the scene. And then within like 20 seconds, I would throw a line to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd say, play with me. And I would ask them some provocative question. I just wanted to see if they could get thrown a curveball. Yeah. I wanted to break down that performative thing. I wanted to not make it performative. I want to see a, if they can improvise mm-hmm. yeah. and break the fourth wall in a way and not be performative. So, and I guess now that I think about it, I would improvise within 20 seconds. You know, I have to say that in that show, I got to act in a way, because if I came back in another life, I might want to go and become like a Broadway musical actor, you know? Mm. I think it'd be really fun, except for I would not do matinees. Only seven <laughs> shows a week. <laughs> yeah. Like I took acting lessons at NYU, but I was not a very good actor. But in that show, I really, I yearned to like play, you know? And I, yeah. I just didn't look the part. I was like this New York Jew who lived in Los Angeles, like, I just don't belong in Texas. So I could never put myself in it. But I would sit there with Brad Leland when we shot in his office. And I said, sit down, Brad. And I'd start play acting with him as Buddy Garrity. Yeah. And I'd say, let's play. And I would try to buy a car or somebody from town. And we'd sit there for 15 minutes and just improvise with each other. I just loved that process. But that show, man, I gotta be honest with you. The stars weren't stars because they didn't act like stars. Yeah. But the most pleasure I think I got from that show was from the Cheeto scene. It's probably my top scene. Watching you guys, the wedding, the scene at the Mexican restaurant, mm-hmm. everybody Garrity scene, because it wasn't make-believe to me anymore. Yeah. Like, I was so invested in those characters. And I so much loved the actors who came from places that you guys came from. Like, yeah. And I was really blowing my mind. Like, they're from Biller University. You know, it's like this Christian college in the middle of West Texas or Waco, and, Texas. Yeah. Waco. And these guys are like you and Steve and Joey. Brad. Joey Ogles. Joey Ogles. Oh, Joey. Oh, God. I yeah. love Joey. Yeah. We love, love Joey. <laughs> Joey is one of my favorites of all time. You, you and us both. <laughs> I have to say that I probably got more pleasure from those moments than almost anything in the show because you guys were so much like regular people to me. I think that the thing that we enjoyed about working with you and what you enjoyed from us is that if you had an idea for something, we just do it. It wasn't like, well, I don't know how this is going to play or how this is going to look or how this is going to affect my career. It was like, screw it. We were young and dumb too. Yeah. Yeah, We we cast you out of, most of you out of uh, Texas. Yeah, Yeah, I was Texas. Yeah. And to then see, I mean, we cast Kevin out of L.A., but Rankin. You know, Kevin yeah. was only supposed to be in like three episodes. Yeah. Like, how do you let that character go? Can't. 
Stacy yeah. and I have talked about this earlier on a, on a previous episode, but I remember like having a conversation with you and Waxman and it was like so stupid because I'm like, I really think that Billy needs to be wearing bikini underwear in the scene. And you're like, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I like went in there like ready to fight for this. And you're like, yeah, all right, fine. Yeah. Great. All right. uh, where here's my Jeffrey Reiner story. It was my first time shooting in the strip club where I was actually working. And just from across the room, you were like, Stacy, you're a dancer, right? And I was like, yeah. And you were like, cool, get up on the pole. And I went, no, no, Jeffrey, I'm a tap dancer. <laughs> so I don't think that's going to look great in this costume, but I like tried. <laughs> I've always wished that we had a Mindy tap dancing strip scene. It's, it's not sexy. The one thing, it's the one that's thing not, we did not that's get a on lot Friday of, Night That's Lights. a lot of jiggling parts. Like, that's not sexy. It's just... It's great to see the careers that were spawned from it. And I've worked with a lot of you since, you know, yeah. I did Fargo with Jesse. I did Dirty John with Connie, Connie. and Steve and Walters was also on an episode. Wonder, and Wonder Woman, where we came and saw you shoot on Hollywood Boulevard. All right. And yeah. uh, people should see that because Annie was fantastic. And to see these careers blossom and like you're watching Jesse nominated for Academy Award. like oh, Unreal. Yeah. I knew this kid when mm-hmm. but i think that that show is also that show is about working class people it was very important that everybody understood that that was one of the things that i bonded with jason cadence was we knew the social class we knew the economics class and that was very important to me i knew what those people had for dinner how they went and shopped in the market it wasn't aspirational it was just realistic Mm-hmm. and giving them dignity. That's what I think I like the best about the show. Here are people who are living very simple lives, who are dealing with stress. There was no like politics involved. Yeah, yeah. Right? It was just the here and now, the smallest little things. Mm-hmm. When Kyle cooked in a scene, he cooked. Mm-hmm. Right? And or if somebody drove in a scene, they drove. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. You can't yeah. do that anymore. I mean, no. No. <laughs> you just drive down that highway and we built that special <laughs> rig that safety would never allow you to do anymore. It just was freedom. And if you get that once in your career, like really once, you're lucky. Yeah. Some but people don't what, ever get it. That's what it every was, actor we've had on says and like for me and like well it's it's downhill from here that was my first show but everyone looking back this is their favorite thing they've ever done essentially also the the sense of family and community that it made and that we're all still like that 15 years later that doesn't happen no No, it, it, it doesn't happen there's still jobs out there that are really great and you love and like i love sticking to a script and i love working a scene and find if it's good writing like yeah. that's a challenge. You know, you go see a Broadway play and you realize, man, they're making this work. But I still have the freedom if something doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I know that it's not true. It's not real. It's yeah. what I said before. There are freedom. There is freedom in restriction. There's something wonderful about trying to figure out why a playwright put a comma in this specific place I do and how that. I can make that work because right. it's not coming naturalistic to me. So how do I make that work? I love that process of being an actor as well. I come from a Shakespeare background. And so like trying to figure out why Shakespeare wrote a scene the way he wrote it or why the iambic pentameter mm-hmm. is happening in this scene it's this way or why you. I go to prose, that's important to me as well. There was something, as I said, coming from a theater background is one of the greatest notes that I think I've gotten from any director. And I was so green. It was my second episode, really barring some soap opera work, my first time being on TV. And there was a moment where Minka Kelly shows up at the door. She's looking for Taylor. It's like the second episode of the show. And as she walked away, I looked at her butt. But I didn't just look at her butt. I looked at her butt like a theater actor would. I did a big, huge thing. (laughs) And I leaned over and I looked. And you said, I love that. It's smarmy. It's great don't get caught. Hmm. And I said, what? And you said, don't get caught. I said, we can see it in your eyes. If you just look at her butt, don't get caught. It's such a stupid thing, but it's a note that I've taken with me from that point on. Is don't get caught. You can feel it. You can think it. It's the same thing as being on stage. Just don't get caught. And that's what I've, I've never used to. that again, but I usually say, don't play it. I think you did that for me on Shameless. You were like, Stacey, don't play it. Just do it. And I was yeah. like, I, you're right. You are absolutely right. Yeah. Stacey came in and I just had to give her one note. And mm-hmm. Then I didn't have to give her a note for the rest of the time. I knew exactly what you meant and you were dead right. Listen, Damn it. We, don't know, we don't know what we're doing half the time. One of my favorite moments in the history of my career is there was a scene 
where you and Mika Kelly and she was spending the night at your house and you went to go use the bathroom. Yes. <laughs> and I just said, just go pee in the sink. <laughs> And you peed in the sink. Just love that. <laughs> did you really around. like you really did pee in the I sink? I can't remember if it was. No, he didn't really pee in it. Like, yeah, but it was the kitchen sink. Yeah. Hey, so when you gotta like, go, you gotta go. Yeah. It was so gross. Well, he could have gone in the backyard. We did have a problem in that house in the couch. I was kept on getting flea yeah. bites, and I didn't know yeah. where it was coming from. It was coming from that couch. The house, bad things. We had Todd McMullen on, and we <laughs> talked about dragging that couch once it. <laughs> Behind the track. Yeah. yeah Todd, Todd and I have worked together a lot. Yes. And him and I laugh still to this day about that couch. I wanted to burn it, but they actually came up with something better. It knows what it did. Because we all thought the show was over in the third season. And I shot that crane shot on the football field of the coach. We never used a crane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I put Todd, not Todd McMullen. No, uh, the other Todd. Todd Campbell. Todd Campbell. Campbell, one of my favorite people as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Todd was operating for me and he could not get this shot. You know, it's like the only time we use a crane shot and I was ready to like throw him off the crane because I had no patience. And but the sun was setting. Yes. Yeah. And there was them alone at that crappy football field, I think near Taylor, Texas. Yeah. And we thought it was over. Yeah. I went and did a pilot and then came back on the air. Yeah. And at that point, I had already committed to another show. But it was time to pass the torch on, you know, to Michael Waxman, who I spoke to this morning. When you do three years of something, as a director, it's a perfect amount of time. And I felt like I had come full circle. I had a natural ending to kind of leave. Yeah. You guys got married. It was a changing of the guard in a lot of respects. You left. And after you left, I mean, naturally, storylines came to a close for Annie, for Gaius, for Yeah, and then we uh, go to a Scott whole other Porter, high for school. For Mika Kelly. We went to a whole other high school and the show carried on. But it was a very different show moving forward. A true testament to the fact that it carried on and still had the success that it did. It's 100% because of the, the shooting style that you and Peter Berg set down originally. And Jason has a huge heart. Yeah. And I think the combination of the grit and Jason's heart is the chaos and the grit and the heart that came out of the writer's room. That was the cocktail. Yeah. That was yeah. it. Because one without the other wouldn't have been as good. Yeah. It worked. We've said this before on the show, but it's lightning in a bottle and it's very difficult to find that. If we knew what the recipe was, obviously we'd all use it on every project that we work on. It was a lack of ego. It was every department feeling like they belonged. It was true talent on so many different levels. Anyway, buddy, I know you're busy. I know you got a million things going on. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Well, it's really nice to be able to talk to old friends people who that I just saw at their nascent kind of places in the business. And I just wish we could do it more. I really wish we could work more often. The opportunities, you know, you go and work on TV shows and you have a limited cast or it takes place in a very specific subset or, but you guys have a long career ahead of you. And oh, I'm doing fine, baby. I'm no complaints on my end. I have a few. (laughs) <laughs> I just want to work with you guys again. And, and I really miss Steve and Joey. So give kisses and hugs and we'll do. And, uh, what do they say? Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. That's right. Something baby. like that. Something like that. Guys, that's it. We made it. That is the end of season three. We are done with season three. I never thought it would happen, but here we are. <laughs> but please join us next time for season four, episode one, entitled East of Dylan. Everything is about to change. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mindy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearizefullheartspod at gmail.com. And follow us on social media. I'm on Instagram at Stacey Orstano. And I'm also on Instagram at underscore Derek Phillips. Check us out on YouTube and blackbarrelmedia.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.